Good afternoon, everyone. I just wanted to briefly um, introduce the, the topic of this site event, which is investigating the societal cost of IP infringement. And uh, Jeffrey Hardy of, of Tracy, or of, of Trace it, excuse me, um, who will uh, lead the panel discussion. But I just kind of wanted to start off by saying that, you know, when we look at IP infringement, it's really just part of kind of a broader um, illicit trade uh, activity that's going on, right? So I think what Trace it is doing is trying to bring in all different forms of illicit trade and in so doing kind of highlighting um, the, the negative impacts of counterfeiting and piracy. Um, so with that, I think you've got an excellent panel here and I'll turn it over to you, Jeff. Thank you, Todd. Um, do I get to use this again? How does that work, Chairman? Or do I wait? Or I'm just so excited to get the opportunity to use the gavel that I, I don't, I'm not really sure. What. Anyway, thank you. Uh, once again, my name is Jeff Hardy. I'm the Director General of the Transnational Alliance to Combat Illicit Trade. Um, I want to thank uh, our colleagues at the World Intellectual Property Office for inviting us to uh, make this presentation at the site event today and making this opportunity available. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, the panelists for joining us. Um, I'm going to introduce them now so that you know who's sitting here, who you're looking at. Um, just to my left is uh, uh, Robbie no Nojo Roji. Uh, he's the uh, CEO of the uh, Anti-Counterfeiting Authority in Kenya. To my right this is a face you're familiar with. She's been chairing the event the last three days. It's Man Amanda uh, Lotharingen, and she's the senior manager of the Companies and Intellectual Property Commission, the CIPC, down in South Africa. And then to my left, far left, is uh, Varda uh, Duale Faf. As she's with um, Novartis, a member company of Traceit. And then to the far right is uh, Piotr Strazowski, and he's the senior economist, and he's the lead officer of the Working Party on Counterfeiting and Illicit Trade at the OECD. And I think um, Christine uh, Pangalan from uh, the Philippines Office of Intellectual Property Rights is online. Is that the case? If you are, Christine, say hi. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. We can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. So that's our panel. And um, what we're going to do today is I'm going to say a few remarks about some reports that we've published at Traceit. And I want to share some of those findings with you. And um, then I'm going to ask our panelists if they can give a response to some of those findings and have a little bit of a dialogue. And at the end, we'll open up the panel if you guys want to have a, a question or two. But let me start by explaining who I am, who our organization is. Trace it is a, is a, well, in the UN, world of the UN, it's a business NGO. So we are, uh, represent business interests. We are membership-based organization with major corporations that have joined Trace it because they're vulnerable to illicit trade in their sector. Um, at the bottom, you see icons that represent the different sectors that we engage in. So you see from left to right, petroleum to pharmaceuticals, tobacco, illicit smuggling of tobacco and alcohol are major forms of illicit trade, illegal fishing and forestry, as you know, if you're from the Geneva area, are major problems um, that are addressed at CITES. Uh, believe it or not, chemicals like pesticides and petroleum are also uh, major forms of illicit trade. And also the counterfeiting of um, consumer goods, uh, every good you can imagine. And you've seen the presentations on these types of things for the last three days. So we cover a lot of ground. And the reason that we do this, as Todd mentioned, is because the approach that, the, uh, that criminals take uh, in one sector is often the same approach taken in another sector. The exploitation of e-commerce platforms, for example, the exploitation of maritime shipping, for example, the exploitation of weak border controls or weak regulatory uh, regulations in one country or another uh, to, tend to be uh, common across these different sectors. So if we can create a common voice, we may be able to make greater change uh, in the fight against illicit trade. So one of the ways that we influence or, or run our advocacy work is to publish uh, fact-based um, 
reports that reveal what some of the problems are. And what I'm gonna to do today is I'm gonna give you a quick snapshot on four of them that combine to illustrate the societal cost of illicit trade. And these are, there's a little handout that we have and also in the WIPO app that summarizes all four of those and there are QR codes that you can snap to get the, the entire, um, you can download the entire report. But what I wanted to do before I get into that is I wanted to relate this. Uh, let me mention let me mention one thing first. The flagship report that we published about five years ago is called Mapping the Impact of Illicit Trade on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So we held an event at the UN Conference for Trade and Development. It's an agency just down the street here. Uh, that has a major commitment to facilitating trade and for defending uh, legal trade to facilitate development in the developing countries. And they were quite interested in our findings. And this is really what launched our work in this space. And I want to relate this, though, to what you're doing. And, you know, I was sitting here for the last two and a half days listening to the ACE presentations, and I heard... Uh, a presentation from Australia, for example, earlier that was talking about the billions in revenue and tax losses associated from streaming, illegal streaming of uh, live events, including sporting events. And I looked back into ACE documents and, for example, in 2022, Denmark gave a presentation on six good reasons why consumers should buy genuine products. In other words, listing the different harms to consumers or where the money went to criminals and the bad guys. There are also presentations at ACE that were talking about uh, damages to the environment. So this week actually was Amanda made a presentation early on about upcycling <laughs> seized counterfeits. This is a way to um, you know, protect the environment. But if you go all the way back to 2017, Italy made the presentation here, this very uh, symposium on best practices in the environmental safe disposal of IP infringing prod products. Well, these two areas that I'm talking about, the first one, the economic losses, that's SDG 8 um, in terms of um, contributions to economic growth and development and, and labor. And then the environmental uh, losses are SDG 12. So I, I ask you ask yourself, what are the what about other environmental impacts associated with manufacturing of counterfeits? Because manufacturing plants are, you know, expelling um, toxic waste into the air, into the water, uh, and those are SDG 6 and SDG, SDG 15 that are designed to protect water and air pollution. And there are many, many more. In fact. The report that I'm going to start talking about lists how uh, illicit trade in various sectors impacts all 17 of the sustainable development goals. Now, I don't know if you can see these um, icons well enough, but along one column, the blue icons are the illicit trade sectors, and the, and the other category are the SDG goals that are specifically and directly negatively impacted um, by illicit trade. Um, our point to that we wanted to make to the UN is that illicit trade poses uh, a triple threat, is what we call it, to sustainable development by crowding out economic activity, delete, uh, depleting government revenues, and raising the cost for actually achieving the SDG. So this is uh, this is a rhetoric that we've we've been repeating here in Geneva for for several years now. Now, what I wanted to do with this presentation, though, is zero in on IP because this body is focused primarily on IP. As I mentioned, of the 10 sectors that we work in, counterfeiting and pi fighting counterfeiting and piracy is one of the primary sectors. And our research has shown that counterfeiting is, um, has a negative impact on nine of the 17 goals. In fact, I think that's the, the, the one category with the greatest impact on the SDG goals. You can see here, there's a snapshot of what those goals are. And I'm gonna run through those real quickly. Um, the first three we've categorized into economic growth, jobs, and consumer health. So as you've heard some of the presentations and I just that you've heard today is that when 
um, counterfeit products are sold uh, outside the normal economy. It robs um, corporations and uh, the, the national economies of GDP growth and jobs. Consumers are exposed to harm. Uh, and it and it's just really just undermines three of the main goals. You can't fight poverty if you don't have economic growth, for example. Um, the other thing that we hear a lot here at ACE is the negative impacts on innovation. And you see SDG four is about uh, quality education, and SDG nine is about industrial edu uh, industrial innovation. So clearly, um, different parts of our report point out how. Uh, counterfeiting and piracy and other forms of IP infringement undermine these goals. I simply just don't have time to get into details for each one of these, but I invite you to look at the report. And then, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, there are many environmental, negative environmental impacts associated with IPR infringements, and these SDG 6, 12, and 15 are clearly uh, explained in our report. The last one is actually co common to all forms of illicit trade, and that's SDG 16, which are goals for peace and justice. And the reason that we've included that is because there is criminal activity involved in all forms of illicit trade, and the criminal activity that undermines uh, the UN's goals for peace and justice. So this is a summary of the first report that we're presenting, and I thought it might be interesting to just do a, a a real quick review of three other reports that we've done. Really, they're um, spinoffs of our major report on the SDGs. And we took a little bit closer look at the impact on investment. And in this study, what we did is we looked at uh, those countries. We trace it ranked um, some uh, 80, 88 different countries on their ability to fight illicit trade. So we ranked them on one axis, and we rank them against a country's credit ratings, their sovereign credit ratings. And the sovereign credit ratings are an indication of a country's ability to attract a foreign investment. And what we found is there's a direct correlation between a country's ability, the, uh, their ability to fight illicit trade and their credit ratings. In other words, the higher the, the better their ability to fight illicit trade, the higher the credit rating, the higher the credit rating, the more uh, foreign investment that they can attract. So our message to governments is do a better job fighting illicit trade. You'll have higher sovereign credit ratings and a better ability to attract investment. Um, a few, I'm plugging some work uh, that the International Chamber of Commerce did a few years ago, and I pulled this up because I knew we had Kenya here as a guest speaker. And we looked at, at that time, the ICC looked much closer at one country and that correlation between IPR rights and investment and found that the stronger were the IPR rights in uh, Kenya, um, the better was the um, inward investment over time. Another report that I wanted to bring to your attention is a study that we did recently called The Human Cost of Illicit Trade, Exposing the Demand for Forced Labor. Long story short is that um, there's a, we found that there was a considerable amount of forced labor and child labor that was present in counterfeiting, specifically in the manufacturing part of counterfeiting and in the distribution part. In the distribution, I mean the street sales, the end sales, not the online part, but you know where you see the the um, the uh, uh, street sales of illicit trade, and so we documented this um, in counterfeiting, but also in nine other sectors. But the takeaway message here is that um, if a government is going to achieve their human rights objectives, in other words, if you're going to be able to reduce forced labor as a major objective for human rights, you have to be able to stop the demand for this type of labor in illicit trade. Um, because it's significant. So um, the reports show a lot of examples, which we don't have time to go into. And then there's one other thing that I wanted to mention, and that was a report that we're going to publish uh, in just a few weeks called The Crooked Connection Between Corruption and Illicit Trade. 
um, which in each one of these, of course, includes a, a, uh, a section or a chapter on IP rights infringement, where we have documented specifically how corruption occurs, because a lot of times we have speeches and we talk about, well, there's corruption that's holding back progress and law enforcement is dealing with corruption or there's corruption in customs. But what does that actually mean in terms of specific examples of activity of bribery or officials looking the other way? So we've taken a lot of times, done a lot of research in revealing how that what, how that actually occurs. And that's what we're going to be talking about in a webinar on February the 22nd. If you want to scan this or if you want to come to our website, it'd be uh, it's open to the public, no charge. And we're going to be um, revealing those findings. We have a significant lineup of speakers from the OECD, from World Customs Organization, Transparency International is going to be doing the introduction for us. And we hope that this will really help make a lot of progress on rooting out corruption where it facilitates illicit trade. So again, the takeaways are, and I'll repeat this, if governments want to achieve the sustainable development goals, if they want to attract foreign investment, if they want to achieve their human rights objectives or eliminate corruption, they must intensify those measures to mitigate illicit trade, stop counterfeiting. It's just one part of the problem, but it's a significant problem that can't be ignored. So that's my, that's my introduction and setup. Um, and I thought, you know, these are our findings um, based on research, based on, you know, our visits to different countries. And I thought what might be interesting for you would be to hear, you know, the response from those people who are fighting counterfeiting on a daily basis on the ground. And so we've invited uh, a very interesting panel from a diverse set of countries um, to share some of their experiences. We're going to do two quick rounds of questions. The first round of questions is going to be on what types of harms they've observed. In other words, the types of things that our reports have found. And then the second round of questions would be an opportunity for them to share some of the measures they've taken to correct those changes. So um, they all know that that's how the system, how this series of questions is going to go. So I'm going to start with um, asking Amanda the first question, and then I'll go to Christine and then Robbie. And I'm going to ask this question. Please share with us some examples on how IPR infringements or counterfeiting, however you want to classify it, negatively impact South Africa's objectives for development, investment, or human rights. Mm -hmm. You can you can start now. Thank you. <laughs> Jeff, thank you very much. At the outset, before I even start talking about the problems in our environment, I want to just emphasize how important it is that an organization like Trasit gets involved in this fight. For governments, it's very difficult to interact with rights holders on an individual basis. So organizations like yourselves and other self-regulatory agencies and bodies, it's crucial to us being successful in this area. And thank you for hosting us this afternoon. So in South Africa, we have exactly the same problems as each one of you have in your countries. We are, none of us is immune to counterfeit goods coming into our marketplaces. We see it in every area of consumable products, in every area of goods that has a market, that area is being counterfeited. So um, we, from a government perspective, prioritize strategically the specific areas that we want to focus on in a year. We have limited capacity in our enforcement areas, as you all do, because we only have so many resources available and we are challenged in terms of their capacity, their know-how and turnover. I don't know how many of you face the challenges in terms of people moving on. The moment they come into the enforcement environment, it's vibrant, it's changing all the time, it's dynamic. They learn a lot of new things and then they are headhunted. So that's also one of the big challenges that we face. But let's get back to what we see in our marketplaces. Our priority areas currently is our creative industry sector. It's definitely for the developing world, a building block to growing our economy to getting social cohesion going in our countries. So the creative industry is always on our priority list. We look at our musicians, our authors, um, 
our playwrights, everybody involved in the um, value chain, photographers, they online piracy is an issue and it's about changing behavior. So all our efforts in that area goes towards making sure the youth understands the impact, making sure they know the value of intellectual property, be creators, be your own, buy your own is the kind of campaigns that we run in this area. The other area that's a priority for us is pharmaceuticals. We thought in our marketplaces that doesn't exist. You can ask any of our politicians whether they think pharmaceuticals are counterfeited in our country and in our value chain, and they would say, no, we don't have a problem. We can give you the evidence. So there's a big battle that we are fighting in terms of our politicians, our political will in this area. The other area that we have seen also growing significantly is our fast moving consumer goods. And those are the things each one of us use on a daily basis. And I'm so sorry to say that my daughter the other day came home with a bunch of goods she bought from a friend. And the goods were refilled, I know, because she should have known growing up in a house like ours. They were refilled bottles of sunlight liquid, OMO detergent, JIC. And they were all authentic original bottles that were recycled we're happy about recycling, but not this kind, recycled and filled with materials that are not even remotely the same as what you would have expect from that kind of products. So that's a huge problem in South Africa. We're very happy for the recycling happening from our rubbish that are thrown away, but I'm always saying, please remove the labels, please remove the labels. So that is happening. It's a big challenge. It's sold for our internet platform. So it limits us as law enforcement bodies to intervene in that value chain because it's a very close one-on-one -on -one distribution of these products. I can go on, I can talk about the motor spare parts um, that we find, but for now, the priority for us lies in anything that our consumers put on their skins, eat, consume, utilize to make sure that they protect it. But we do not leave the clothing and footwear ind industries behind. That's um, an area that we always focus on because that's directly linked to our economic growth in those sectors. And that's where our partnership agreement on the upcycling project has played a significant role with our Department of Trade and Industry, stimulating small businesses to get involved, creating new job opportunities through what we see as supporting our environment as well. So I'm going to leave it at that. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Amanda. All right, so let me turn to Christine, and we'll try to bring you online. Hi, Christine, I see you. Um, yes, hello, you, good evening, uh, Jeff. I'm going to ask you the same question, if you can share some examples on how IPR infringements are negatively infecti affecting things uh, in, um, in the Philippines. Okay, thank you so much. And um, I would like to thank um, the World Intellectual Property Organization as well as Tracy for this um, session. And um, in terms of the Philippines, um, technology and intellectual property have become prominent topics in global conversations surrounding trade and investment. Due to the nature of technology-driven and copyright-based industries, as well as the increasing number of transactions being made online, these dialogues are inextricably linked to matters concerning intellectual property, intellectual property rights, and their protection. On a macroeconomic level, IPR infringements and counterfeiting negatively affect investors' business confidence in the Philippines, especially in IP-intensive industries. At the micro level, intellectual property rights infringements and counterfeiting also negatively impact inventors entrepreneurs and creators from benefiting from the fruits of their labor. As a fundamental aspect of human rights is economic well-being, and this is where intellectual property rights comes into the picture. Not only do we need to provide a safe environment for these stakeholders to flourish and to enjoy the benefits of the or the fruits of their labor, that is intellectual property rights, but at the same time, we also need to provide the consuming public with secure and legitimate mechanisms to access goods, products, and services from these stakeholders. On the part of human rights, um, the basic human right to own is being curtailed by the fact that their intellectual property, just like any other assets, are being taken from them. 
the creator of intellectual property right loses the right to exploit his creation to its fullest extent if someone has already copied it. Further intellectual property infringement or proliferation of counterfeit goods in general greatly affects the Philippines growth in terms of economic and social impact, um, such as in the following instances. Um, it hurts the legitimate businesses in terms of the loss of sales or revenues for our legitimate businesses and enterprises due to the proliferation of counterfeit products. And in terms of online piracy, loss of royalties. Um, and based on the data for 2019 released by the EU IPO and the OECD, the estimated volume of international trading counterfeit and pirated products amounted to as much as 464 billion US dollars in that year or 2.5% of the world trade. And the Philippines is included in that data. As to online piracy, according to the study conducted by the Media Partners Asia entitled The Impact of Piracy on the Philippines' Creative Economy, the Philippines is second only to Indonesia as having the most number of users who access piracy websites. However, in 2022, the Philippine video sector lost an estimated 781 million US dollars in revenue due to online piracy. And if online piracy in the Philippines is not brought under control, the report estimated that there could be 31 million users of piracy services by 2027, with an annual revenue leakage to the video sector of 1 billion US dollars. And um, enhanced piracy controls, which may include effective site blocking regulations, would result in more legal customers to the video industry, increased overseas investment, and greater revenue growth. And this is where the focus of the Philippine government, particularly the Intellectual Property Office of the Philippines, um, is being um, given. And also, there are a loss of revenues for the government in terms of the um, taxes that are supposed to be paid since the counterfeiters or infringers do not pay taxes. There are also loss of jobs and income for the workers. And of course, if you're talking about counterfeit pharmaceuticals and cosmetic products, there's risk to health and safety. Um, as of now in the Philippines, there's a proliferation of online pharmacies. Um, but in the Philippines, it's not allowed to um, sell um, pharmaceutical products via the online media platform. It's only through the physical um, medical drug stores that medicines can be um, sold and bought. And also, um, the low quality of counterfeit medicines affect individuals in a variety of ways. Um, for example, um, these, these adverse effects could um, include toxicity from incorrect active ingredients, failure to cure or prevent future diseases, thereby increasing mortality, morbidity, and prevalence of disease. Um, it also contributes to the progression of antimicrobial resistance and drug-resistant infections. Um, there's also loss of confidence in healthcare professionals, health programs, and health systems, mainly because the consumers who buy counter counterfeit products do not know that these um, counterfeit medicines are not being dispensed by the legitimate healthcare professionals. And um, there's also an increase in out-of-pocket and health system spending on healthcare because these medicines um, do not bring the relief that is supposed to be given to the patient. Um, there's also loss of income to the patient due to prolonged illness and, of course, death. And um, in the Philippines, we also saw a trend where um, um, the selling of counterfeit, counterfeit products or infringing products are a source of funding for illegal activities. Um, primarily, the Philippines uh, is um, included in the gray list of the um, Financial Action Task Force. Uh, for violation of IP right vis-a-vis -vis money laundering. That is the reason why um, the IPOFIL um, is um, collaborating with the Anti-Money Laundering Council of the Banco Central of the Philippines in order to address this issue on the Philippines being in the gray list. And also, um, the most important thing that we saw is that um, counterfeiting and infringement has a negative impact on innovation and the creative culture. Um, because um, we see a trend where um, the consumers of these infringing products have a low, low regard for originality. And therefore, sometimes um, it becomes a trend that um, the crime of in 
counterfeiting or infringement is being is being normalized mainly because a lot of people buy this infringing products and lastly um, one of the effects is of course low trust in the intellectual property system so that's all for the philippines chef thank you thank you christine that was very clear and i from my notes that i was taking you managed to touch on sdg one three four, eight, nine, 12, and 16. So good job. Okay, um, turning back to the room here on my left, Robbie, same question to you. What's, uh, how are things in, in Kenya in terms of negative impacts on investment, for example, human rights? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jeff, for that uh, question. Uh, once again, is to thank you, uh, Tacit, uh, Tracit, and uh, the entire team as well as WIPO for inviting us here to give some insight on issues of counterfeiting in Kenya. Uh, as my colleagues have said, Kenya is not uh, uh, also alone in this. We are also suffering from uh, effect of counterfeiting. And uh, more so, uh, in terms of the opportunities uh, lost, uh, job opportunities, uh, there was a report that uh, indicated that between 2016 and 2018, we have lost between 3,202 jobs to about 9,158 jobs lost. And that, of course, is negatively impacting on SDG 8, on the laws of economic activities. And uh, this also goes against the Kenyan constitution because one of the Bill of Rights, there is uh, um, articles on right to uh, good health, uh, issues of social care, as well as uh, building and uh, where the people are supposed to stay, the habit habitats. Then on the issues of uh, FDI, uh, counterfeiting, uh, continue to undermine the confidence in the market. And uh, the country has lost between 28 billion Kenya shillings to about 36 billion within the year 2016 uh, to 2018. That one also affecting the issues of uh, investment and in the issues of uh, risk to food and security because we have quite a number of goods that we have seized uh, relating to pesticides uh, close to and fertilizers about 22.0 percent of the goods that we have seized since 2010 that constitute uh, 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 agricultural pro produce i mean agricultural product uh, that particularly the uh, pesticides and uh, input, agricultural input like fertilizers. Uh, this also affect our food security for the country. In terms of uh, health uh, implication, it's important to note that uh, we have issues of alcoholic beverages that constitute about 16% of all the goods that have been seized since that time. Uh, ph pharmaceuticals constitute about 2.3% and also automotive parts, about 4%. And when we talk about automotive parts, is the one that are used uh, for vehicle repairs and uh, auto parts. And you can imagine when this accident happened. For example, in Kenya, uh, every year we have about 4,000 deaths occurring on our roads. Uh, that statistic between 3,000 and 4,000 uh, people. And that one definitely affects uh, the, the human rights of uh, those dependent on those people who are dying on the roads. Uh, that's quite a huge loss in terms of that. In terms of safety, elec electricals and electronics uh, constitute about 22.4%. Uh, and you can imagine this also has an impact uh, in terms of safety uh, in our houses and where people are living. And that one can have a lot of impact and continue to suffer uh, as a result of that. Others uh, think uh, we have issues like uh, pirated books. Pirated books uh, is about 1.03% of the entire uh, seized goods that we have seen since 2010 as well as the stationaries and the hardware materials uh, for building the houses. That one is also has an impact. And again, also posing the challenge on the safety 
of the users, about 15%. So all you know, I can say that uh, we have uh, had a lot of challenges in this. And finally, it has also posed uh, a challenge to government in terms of the revenue because the government has also witnessed reduced revenues. And once we have the reduced revenues, it, it means that the government is unable uh, to address the issues that it has been obligated by the constitution under the Bill of Rights, like provision of social services uh, to the people because of the declined revenues uh, within the, the country. So that's what I can say. Thank you. Thank you, Robbie. I think, you know, I, according to my notes, the three speakers here I've touched on, uh, I think, 15 of the 17 SDGs, which is more than we even have in our report. Now, if you look at why the why the UN has you know written the SDGs, it's a roadmap for sustainable development to 2030, right? Um, it's a plan, but it's also a narrative. It's a story, and and we hear different stories from different countries. Here's Africa, Asia, um, South Africa. How do we tell those? How how do we tell each of those stories in a concise narrative? And that's why we've why why we've written this report on the negative impact of illicit trade on the SDGs. How can we tell that story concisely to governments? How can we better motivate them to increase resources to fight these harms? Um, let me now turn to um, private sector voice, um, Varda. Let me ask you, Novartis Global Corporation. Um, inventing and selling pharmaceutical products around the world. What are you seeing? I mean, what are some of the examples on how illicit trade in pharmaceuticals is undermining public safety? Thank you very much, Jeff. And I want to take a minute to echo as well uh, my fellow panelists. Thank you to Waipo and Jeff for this opportunity. So as we all know, the pharmaceutical industry continues to be challenged by the illicit trade of falsified medicines. So that includes the counterfeiting, diversion, tampering and theft of products. As we can imagine, and as my panelists as well echoed, this has a major impact on patient safety and an increasingly bigger impact uh, as a global health challenge as outlined by the WHO in 2020. Now more concretely to answer your question in terms of what we are seeing at Novartis. In the last year alone, we had cases of falsified medicines across 42 countries resulting in the seizure of nearly 3 million units of falsified medicines. I, I wanna echo here the point made by Amanda earlier. We know that often a lot of countries are elected to say that there are cases of illicit pharmaceuticals in their countries. But again, I just want to echo that in a single year, we had cases in 42 countries. This is based on what we investigated, meaning this is what we know of. It also, of course, begs the question of what else is out there. Um, and again, it, went, it gives you a good picture of the scale, essentially, of the problem that we are facing. Now, in terms of trends, counterfeiting remains a major incident type that we continue to see and have seen in the last years. That being said, in 23, we did notice a higher risk area um, in two different uh, topics. One is related to pharmaceutical, the theft of pharmaceutical products and illegal diversion meaning products that are intended for one market that are being intercepted and then sold in another market. Of course, we developed uh, some risk mitigation strategies to, to mitigate the patient safety risks locally of these new additional threats. Now, in terms of the actual patient safety impacts, they are, of course, multifaceted. So Christine covered really well um, what sort of impacts the falsified medicines have on patients. She mentioned the harmful content that you can find inside the products, as well as it leading to potentially therapeutic failure, serious harm, and or death. What I want to add to that is at Novartis, over the last five years, 90% of the cases whereby we had products that we forensically tested were classified as a level three in terms of patient safety risk. Meaning for us, this is the highest category of risk. And in these cases, we often found that the products either contain no active ingredient at all, or they had harmful chemicals in it, such as heavy metals, poisons, uh, chemicals, non-declared uh, APIs, and other uh, impurities as well. So again, it puts into perspective the type of patient safety risks this has on, on the patients themselves. 
Now, more broadly speaking, from a societal perspective, we all know that falsified medicines, again, they undermine the patient's uh, trust in effective medicines, which can, of course, then result in a loss of trust in not only healthcare professionals, but the overall healthcare system. In the last few years, we've also noticed more and more cases that involve social security fraud schemes. So this is cases where criminal organizations are intercepting medicines that are intended for the public sector. So hospitals and pharmacies, uh, they are often for institutional use only. They are intercepting these products, illegally diverting them, and of course, privately commercializing these products, either within the country itself or to neighboring countries. And as you can imagine, for a profit. This obviously has an impact on access to medicines for the patients locally, but of course it depletes the healthcare system in that given country. And for countries where the healthcare system is more vulnerable, the uh, negative impacts of that can of course be multiplied. So Jeff, over back to you. Thanks, Varda. And let me just point out something. Um, there is a difference between uh, falsified medicines that she's talking about, falsified and substandard medicines, and counterfeit medicines that involve an IP infringement. But they're similar. They're similar problems, and they can be solved with similar remedies. And that's one of the reasons. That's one way to understand how trace it works across sectors and works, um, you know, to solve multiple problems. So. Let me now turn to uh, the IGO portion of the panel. I thought it'd be interesting to invite uh, another intergovernmental organization to have a response to some of the work that we've done. So, uh, Piat, let me ask you, the OECD and the Working Party on Countering Illicit Trade uh, that you've run for a long time, probably the most prolific international organization out there on this subject. Uh, has done an enormous amount of work in this space. So have your findings been consistent with what I've been talking about today? And what are you seeing in terms of how IPR infringement harms SDGs and other social objectives? Um, thank you, Jeff. Um, before I go to the subject, let me just echo all the panelists saying it's, uh, it's a pleasure being here. And thank you, Trace it. Thank you, WIPO, for organizing this panel. It's important impossible to combat counterfeiting on its own within one government or within one country. It's essential to collaborate. So once again, Jeff, Todd, it's a great job. Um, back to your question about, well, at the OECD, uh, I'm an economist and my job, primary job is to enhance evidence on counterfeiting, right? And this is a very difficult task. Um, I bet most of you here have some IP background, right? So you might be familiar with these difficulties, not only because measuring counterfeiting is difficult, but also because many people already have some prejudices, images in their heads when it comes to counterfeiting. Um, my sister-in-law graduated from math and she works in a bank on some risk assessments. And in every meeting, I have no bloody idea what she's talking about when it comes to job, so, some math formulas, right? But whenever I meet someone and say, hey, I work on counterfeiting, this person, ah, I know. I know what you're talking about. It's marketing, right? Oh, fake Louis Vuitton bags, these, or something about sustainability. I mean, people have some images about counterfeiting in their heads. And that's why, to me, it's essential to develop evidence that is robust, that's grounded in data, right? That is not based on, oh, it seems like, but relies on statements, it is, right? It is correct, it equals to. Our data, well, I'm an economist, right? So our data come from customs. I want to say a big thank you to Alena, who is here from CBP, great data. And customs do great jobs that then we kind of use to produce reports. Um, and what we see is indeed counterfeiting is, is a big problem that has lots of negative effects. Looking at counterfeiting from the SDGs perspective, we see um, the third one, right? Health and safety. Illicit trade and counterfeit medicines amounts to $4.4 billion a year. That's, that's our estimate. And here I need to pause and say that we talk about scale, but scale is not effects, right? A one single pill uh, can be worth 10 cents, but this single pill of fake drug well, for cancer, blood pressure can kill. So on the scale side, it's 10 cents. On the effect side, well, I don't know how much you value a life of a person. It's I don't dare even say. So when we talk scale, we don't talk effects, right? 
health and safety aspects, 4.4 billion dollars. Well, decent work, it's number eight, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, innovation industry, that's number nine. Well, we see that there's jobs losses. We see measurable effects on lower tax revenues. That's something we see that we measure. That's something counterfeit causes. Goal number 16, peace and justice, right? We did a report that looked at illicit trade in conflict affecting countries and Middle East and North Africa, countries like Yemen, Syria, or Libya. And we found that many parties engaged in conflicts there derive huge profits from illicit trade. And here it's not only counterfeiting, right? It's all sorts of sectors because these guys, they are not lawyers. And even if they are lawyers, they don't care. As long as it brings profits, it's good. And one of our conclusions was, um, well, now I contradict myself because it seems like, it seems like for them, illicit trade is not just a side effect of their activities, but it's one of the incentives to continue the conflicts. Kind of, as we say in Polish, it's easy to fish in the mud water, right? Muddy water. Uh, these conditions and stability create for them good opportunities for profits that they derive from illicit trade. So back to your question, Jeff, of course, of course, counterfeiting impacts SDGs, hurts SDGs, but it's important to have a robust, strong evidence to support it, not anecdotes. Thank you. Okay, so thanks to the panelists for the first round. And like I said, I think every SDG has been covered here. And let me take it back to the discussions on the ACE we've heard for the last three days. There's a there's a standing topic area where member states are invited to share their experiences on awareness. And a lot of the awareness presentations tend to be, that I've seen at least, tend to focus on awareness for the consumer. Raising an awareness to the consumer and Many of your IPO offices have real robust programs to do this, explaining to them why it's harmful to ingest a counterfeit product or to put a counterfeit makeup on their face or how buying such a product might, you know, be um, um, from un involved child labor or that the funds might go to organized crime. That's good for helping to stop the demand side of counterfeit. I think it's a critically important part of what needs to be done. I think what we're trying to do at Trace It by telling this story through the SDGs is raising awareness to the governments themselves of why they need to increase resources for IP enforcement or for your colleagues uh, at Customs, for example, to control um, borders. So that's why we're here is to try to make that message stronger so that you can perhaps be more effective at enforcing IP rights, which is the next part of the questions, is what are some of the experiences that you can share? And I know some of them have been highlighted you know, or during the day, but for the purposes of this panel, and in response to the negative societal impacts we've been talking about, what are some of the top things that you've been doing in South Africa, for example, Amanda? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, if you let me loose for a minute or two, I'll just take the whole floor. <laughs> because in South Africa, we have seen that we have to do things differently. We, we have always been building capacity in law enforcement. I talked about the high turnover. So our training and capacity building programs run hand in hand with industry players, rights holders, representatives. We cannot go at it alone. You have to have a collaborative effort. You have to draw in your priority industries. So as I mentioned, pharmaceuticals, liquor, fast-moving consumer goods, those are the industry players that we invite on our training initiatives. Secondly, our education and awareness targeting women, the mothers that buy the products, the mothers that educate the youth, very important sector for us also in our SMME sector, small and medium and micro enterprises, we target women because we have seen that they grow the economy and our government is actually focusing on empowerment of women. So that also now filters through into our work in the IP and then our youth, the children. So we have... Currently, we will be launching an influencer campaign. It is something that we have seen winning awards in Switzerland. It was hosted here. 
it is the whole concept of following somebody that inspires you and if we then get them involved in our messaging around intellectual property and respect for ip we hope to see many wins so that campaign will be kicking off in january and run up until world intellectual property day where we will then have the big reveal um, we have also part of our upcycling project we have um, I actually took a shot at writing a little story about the impact of counterfeiting on a level that targets children 8 to 12 years old. So like a bedtime story. Hopefully it's not a horror, <laughs> but it's definitely not a fairy tale. And it goes along with the rabbits that we are um, upcycling from the counterfeit goods. And it's sort of telling the story about what's happened to this piece of material and how it's been rescued not to go into a landfall site. I think that's about it. We also have had a couple of policy directives, interventions, policy dialogues, we call them very valuable. We have had one on liquor and the toy industry. So we have seen a lot of toys in our marketplaces, especially board games um, that are being sold. It replaced the CDs on the street corners, the physical DVDs that has had movies on them. We are now seeing that those products that sold is board games on street corners. Mm -hmm. So um, we are also focusing on the toys industry, especially because it's the children that plays with these things and there are many harmful effects in that area. So yeah, we are keeping up the good fight and trying our best coming up with innovative ideas. Lastly, I know Pewtor is very interested in data. So what we are trying to put together is a cell phone application that can be used by our law enforcement partners. And I was very interested in the discussion around artificial intelligence because we could perhaps build this artificial intelligence tool into what we are having exists what's existing in the technology that we are using to make it easier for our enforcement partners at the out front to deal with the goods when they do come across it. So yeah, um, we are excited about the year ahead and hopefully we can collaborate to make some of these things come true sooner than later. Thank you. Great, thanks Amanda. Um, I'm not sure by screen, if do we know if Christine's still with us? Christine, yes, are you I'm still, still here, Jeff. Yes. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, listen, so we were switching over to, you know, measures that you, at the Philippines IPO office might be taking to, you know, ensure that IP infringement doesn't undermine forced labor um, or create demands for forced labor or anything you want to talk about in terms of some of your success stories. And I, I also want to mention that uh, Trace it recently signed a memorandum of understanding with Christine and uh, the Philippines IPO. And one of the objectives of that MOU were to explore where areas that we could collaborate on stronger enforcement, not just in the Philippines, but also in the ASEAN region where the Philippines is a le leading voice. So if you felt like mentioning any of your efforts in ASEAN at this point, you're certainly welcome to take a minute on that. Okay, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, well, in the Philippines, um, there are a lot of activities and programs that we have in order to ensure that infringement neither undermines development nor enable illicit trade in the Philippines. And some of these measures are um, the following. Well, first, you mentioned already the MOU, which we have signed with Traceit, mainly because um, we see Traceit as a valid um, partner in our fight against counterfeiting and piracy. And um, we look forward to more collaborations with Traceit. And your, your researches and your um, papers and um, reports that you um, issue are very valuable and helpful um, to the um, Philippine government, particularly the IPOFIL. Now, in terms of the government, um, one of the programs that we have is that we have the National Committee on Intellectual Property Rights, or the NCIPR, which is an interagency body. Um, which it has been in place since 2008, and um, the committee is tasked to formulate and implement plans and policies, as well as strengthen the protection and enforcement of intellectual property rights in the Philippines. To date, the body has a total of 15 member agencies, all from the government, in which IPOFIL serves as the vice chair and acting chair. 
and the committee has been effective in ensuring a whole of government approach in cases of IP violations. And the NCIPR is considered a best practice in the ASEAN region. Um, so part of the programs that we conduct for the NCIPR are the product identification seminar in order to um, keep them abreast on how they will be able to identify counterfeit from legitimate um, products. And then we also conduct intellectual property seminar for our law enforcement agencies, mainly because our law enforcement agencies like the police and the National Bureau of Investigation are part of the NCIPR. And then we also conduct judges colloquium um, because in the Philippines, we have a dedicated um, special commercial courts who handle intellectual property rights violation cases. So the IPOFIL conducts um, seminars yearly for our judges in order to keep them abreast on the trends on counterfeiting and piracy and also um, to guide them on how um, they will be able to resolve intellectual property rights violation cases speedily. And we also have um, partnership, of course, with the youth. In terms of the private sector, um, the IPOFIL also has a memorandum of understanding with the um, with the in um, internet service providers, okay? And um, this MOU gave rise to the administrative site blocking rules, which has been put in place and has become effective in the Philippines starting January 13 of this year. The site blocking rules was put in place as a result of an MOU between the five leading internet service providers in the Philippines and IFOFIL. Under the MOU, the signatory ISPs commit to willingly block sites directly upon IPOFIL's request, which is issued after a determination of violation, thereby streamlining the current process, which requires the involvement of the National Telecommunications Commission. This is the agency being the primary regulator of ISPs. The said MOU is the first in Asia and the second in the world after Germany. And to further solidify initiatives on site blocking, um, the National Telecommunications Commission and IPOFIL likewise signed an MOU that widens IPOFIL's oversight to over 300 ISPs who are not yet part of the IPOFIL site blocking MOU with the ISPs, thus obligating them to disable access to piracy sites. Moreover, there are also pending bills on strengthening the enforcement powers of the IPOFIL, as well as site blocking bills in Congress, which the IPOFIL actively supports. We also have uh, an MOU with the Anti-Money Laundering Council, and um, it aims to promote and encourage cooperation and coordination between IPOFIL and the uh, AMLC to effectively prevent, control, detect, investigate, and prosecute violations of the IP code money laundering activities arising therefrom, and terrorism financing. And um, the AMLC is also poised to join the NCIPR this year. Okay, on an international level, the Philippines particularly, IPOFIL is actively participating in different fora such as the ASEAN Working Group on Intellectual Property Cooperation or the AWGIPC, as well as the ASEAN Network of IPR Experts or the ANI which the IPOFIL previously chaired for nine years, as well as the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation IPR Experts Group, or the APEC-IPEG, where IPOFIL is currently serving as the chair. This enables the IPOFIL to enrich its knowledge and build its capacity on combating counterfeiting and infringement, while imparting also to other economies and other ASEAN member states its experience on the same. And lastly, I wish to reiterate that a strong IP regime will definitely attract investments by assuring investors that their rights will be safeguarded. This is particularly relevant in industries such as the pharmaceuticals, um, technology, and entertainment, where substantial capital is required for research and development. Industries that heavily rely on knowledge, technology, and intellectual assets such as biotechnology, pharma, and software development are often attracted to regions with strong IPR protection. The assurance of protecting these valuable assets encourages investment in knowledge-intensive sectors. And that's why the Philippines, um, Philippines focus on this. And a robust IPR regime acts as an incentive for innovation. When businesses know that their inventions and creations are well protected, they are more likely to invest in research and development. I think our um, 
representative from Novartis will be able to um, agree on me on this, uh, agree with me on this. And this in turn can attract investors looking for opportunities in industries that thrive on innovation. And stronger IPR enforcement creates a favorable investment climate by providing legal assurances, mitigating risks, and attracting industries that place a premium on IP protection. This in turn can contribute to economic growth and development. However, of course, it's essential to note that while stronger IPR enforcement can be an attractive factor, it should be balanced also with considerations such as fair use, access to essential medicines, and the promotion of innovation for the greater good. Um, and striking this balance is crucial for creating an environment that not only protects IT, but also promotes societal benefits and sustainable development. Um, thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you, Christine. Very impressive, as always. That could have been the keynote address for this whole conference. Um, so um, I look forward to working with you this year, too. Thank you. Um, let me now just turn to you, Robbie. Um, maybe you have a few examples you could share of your, with your work at ACA. Thank you very much. The AIM system, that is the AIM system, uh, that is currently has got uh, around four modules. One of the modules that we're using is one for imports, so that we are checking on the imports for recognition, uh, because 80% of the counterfeited goods that are coming in Kenya, they are, uh, they are from imports. And then we also have the one for deport module uh, that is working on uh, ensuring that seized goods can be traced and tracked uh, for for being taken to court as exhibits. And then we also have uh, issues of uh, what we are saying, research. Research is also very key to us, what we are working on, so that we are able to address and advise the government in terms of uh, policy formulation in addressing the issues of counterfeiting within the country. And on the demand side, how do we address the demand side? Uh, we have robust uh, awareness creation mitigation measures that we have a department that normally does that and together with that we have even come up with a counterfeiting curriculum where we want even consumers uh, to train on counterfeiting so they're able to understand the impact and the import of counterfeiting on the supply side uh, we have a collaborative, collaborative arrangement uh, with the government agencies and uh, the umbrella called BCOCC, uh, that is Border Control uh, Coordinating Committee, uh, which comprises about 19 government agencies, uh, so that we are able to protect the borders and ensure that uh, no counterfeit goods get into the country. This includes the Revenue Authority, the Bureau of Standard, the police, uh, the one for World Drive, that Kenya World Drive Service, among other agencies. Again, on the supply side, we have, are focusing more on intelligence-led inspections for our inspectors. Uh, once we do this, uh, they are able to either act on their own motion or through a motto or through the complaints that come uh, through to us. And then after that, we have litigation. And since last year, we have produced what we are calling compounding of uh, uh, IP cases so that uh, we're able to deal with them within the shortest time possible, instead of taking some of these cases to court. Uh, last year, we were able to dispense with about 120 cases uh, from February. And this one uh, is being done by the executive uh, director uh, upon admission by the infringer that they have, a, they have committed a crime. And then we are able to find them uh, some, some money uh, for that to ensure that whatever is seized can also be destroyed. And this one is seeming to be working uh, for the authority. Uh, the other one is on the issues of destruction of seized goods. Last year alone, uh, we seized and destroyed about uh, goods worth about 300 million Kenya shillings. And this one is also becoming a deterrent measure against those people who are involved in the counterfeiting business. So those are some of the activities that uh, the authority has been implementing. Thank you. 
Very interesting, Robbie. Let me ask you a quick question on the last point about the seizure and destruction of three hundred million dollars worth. Who pays for that for the destruction? Uh, this is uh, coming from the fines that we normally charge the people who have gotten or who have been uh, whose goods have been seized, because they normally pay some amount in form of destruction fees mm -hmm. and fines. So this is the fine now, now, that fines that now we use when it comes to the destruction of those goods. Okay. Yes. All right. Thanks. Okay. So listen, we're getting near the end. Let me, I've got, I'm going to turn to Varda and then to Piatra and we're wrapping up and we can get back to the session. Okay. Hopefully you have a few minutes before. So um, Varda from the, again, from the private sector perspective, what's your strategy for mitigating falsified medicines and protecting patient safety? I mean, do you have any examples of some partnerships that you could share? Thank you, Jeff. I certainly do. But before I get into that, I just definitely want to take the opportunity to, again, really echo the importance of the last points that, Robbie, you brought up in regards to the destruction of um, seized goods. We find that more and more in a lot of the cases that we work on, um, that these goods, when they're not properly destroyed in terms of counterfeit medicines and the packaging, that they're reused and then re-put again in, into the supply chain. So I think that is an absolutely critical part of it. So in terms of the strategy that we have in place, I want to highlight three key strategic area for us. The first is that we continuously actively collect intelligence so that we can monitor markets both offline and online. This monitoring is absolutely critical for us to fully understand how we are impacted by falsified medicines and in different regions. So as I outlined um, earlier in my response, um, this market monitoring allows us to really be able to um, track and map where the new risk areas are. So, for example, as I mentioned, we outlined in the past year that we had more and more theft cases in certain regions, more cases related to diversion and the sort of social security fraud related cases that are popping up, for example, a lot in Colombia and in China. So, again, this sort of risk monitoring is absolutely critical for us to put in place an effective mitigation strategy. Now, the second part I wanna highlight is related to timely authentication. So over the last three years, the timely authentication of falsified medicines locally has been a key part of our strategy. So to accelerate the detection locally, we actually implemented a new project. This is what you're looking at now on the screen. It's called AuthentiField by Novartis. It's a mobile cloud-enabled pocket-sized spectrometric sensor that essentially allows you to test medicines directly in the field within minutes. So as you could see, you just put the pill directly on the sensor. It emits a bit of a light and there it's connected to a cloud-based environment. And within minutes, it will tell you whether or not the product that you're testing is a genuine product or a counterfeit one. This solution reduces the testing time frame from weeks to days. Um, Jeff, you mentioned earlier initiatives on the ground. This one is a really good example because now the solution is deployed in 15 countries, four of which are based in Africa. Um, and as part of our 2024 deployment strategy, we will expand as well in additional countries. And again, this is important because we estimated that in the past, it usually would take on average about six weeks to get a medicine from the place it sees to the laboratory. So that's six weeks in terms of time that we lose, that we cannot go back to the law enforcement and confirm what is the nature of the product that they're looking at. So it delays the investigation from that perspective. It delays our timely uh, reporting to health authorities as well as the WHO. So at Novartis, we are committed to report these cases to the World Health Organization within a 10-day timeframe. That allows them to essentially make timely decisions when it comes to issuing potential patient safety alerts. So again, the timely detection and the timely reporting of falsified medicines is absolutely a critical part, and that's a key part of our strategy. And Attentive Field by Novartis has really uh, played a big role in that. Essentially, our hope um, is that we are able to accelerate our response to authorities uh, and law enforcement. And the last sort of engagement and strategic area I'll share um, is related to creating long-term sustainable deterrent impact. And to do so, we work externally with local authorities, of course, on enforcement actions, 
but then internally as well with our IP, legal IP colleagues, in order to progress on civil and criminal litigations, as we believe that this is what's going to make these crimes deterrent in the long run. Over to you, Jeff. Okay, thanks, Varda. Let me ask a quick question on this authentic field by Novartis. You mentioned it's implemented in four countries in Africa. Are either any of those countries Kenya? Yes, Kenya, Ivory Coast, Egypt, and Nigeria. That's great, because I know just during the break, Robbie was telling me that he's certainly in position to help facilitate um, trace it connections throughout the region in East Africa. So maybe we this maybe this panel could create an opportunity to work together. Absolutely, All right. yes. Absolutely. Right. One last voice for you, perspective from um from Piatra from OECD. I know um, you know, I think something that fits nicely into this whole discussion is the uh, vulnerability of SMEs to illicit trade. Um maybe you could share some perspectives on that with us. Well thank you. Um we've heard some great stories about good examples how to combat counterfeiting. Well, when we did this report with our EU IPO partners on the effects of counterfeiting on SMEs, uh, I'm afraid we had no such uh, stories. And actually, I don't have much time, so I'll just quote um, an SME delegate from a well, well-developed well country, a very wealthy country in Europe, um, who developed a great product. And he told me that to develop this product, he got lots of support coordinated support from his government. Uh, he did it initially in a special incubation center, right? That was provided by local authorities. He got office space, he got IT equipment. Then once he developed the product, uh, he got great information from local IP office about IP toolkits, right? Or what types of IP are available to protect this product, how and where to register this IP. Once the product was in the development phase, right, on the market, he got extremely advantageous tax treatments. That was great. But then it stopped. Once the product became counterfeit, attacked by counterfeiters, uh, he felt he was lost. Right? So he said, like, the government, in a coordinated way, spent lots of time and effort to plant a tree. But once there's juicy apples, everybody can steal them. And I'm lost with no support. And actually, the company went bankrupt. Um, so I'll stop here with maybe negative, yet to me very powerful message. Thank you. Well, hold up that report again, because that's a terrific report. You can get that online at the OECD's website. So we are going to um, end it here um, because we have the obligation for the official UN meeting that's going to start up in 13 minutes. And nonetheless, we have to return Madam Chairman to her role in less than 15 minutes. So I thank you all for showing up. I thank the speakers all for sharing their views. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.